Good morning to those online. I'm very sorry if you didn't have breakfast looking out over a lake this morning. <laughs> I won't have breakfast tomorrow morning looking out over a lake. Well, I guess I'll have it looking down from 30,000 feet, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite the same, though, is it? <laughs> it's not as good. Um, you know where we're going this morning, and you know how we're going to go. We'll start with Lexio on Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. For those online, I am ready, if you are ready with that QR code, I am ready to hear what speaks to you. And I will read it first. We will have a time of silence together, sitting under God's word. That's quite powerful in a big space, isn't it, to have silence? We haven't done a lot of that the last few days. <laughs> Josh, your worship reading has been brilliant. That was not uh, a backhanded comment on that. I have loved it. And let me just say, even as he was singing Count the Stars, it felt so fitting for where we're going today, where God is inviting us to imagine what we cannot imagine. And, and the whole point, it seems to me, of God asking Abraham to count the stars is he couldn't, right? It doesn't mean you don't start counting, but it does mean you know you won't ever get there. You won't ever finish. Uh, so appropriate for where we're going. Uh, and the second reading for the Lexio, is Jose here? Brilliant. Jose's going to pop up, and I hope read in Spanish. That grew out of a glorious conversation last night about his ministry to Hispanics here in this diocese. Uh, and I look forward to more in the car to the airport this afternoon. Thank you, Jose. Shall we pray first? Lord God, who brought the world into being through your word and graciously has given us printed copy of your word. We ask that you would create a new in us through your word this morning. Speak to us and work in us beyond our imagining. All of it for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.
a Él que puede hacer muchísimo más que todo que podamos imaginarnos o pedir, por el poder que obra físicamente en nosotros. A Él sea la gloria en la iglesia y en Cristo Jesús por todas las generaciones, por los siglos de los siglos. Amén. Thank you, thank you. Oh, Cynthia, the iPad has turned off. I just need you to... Okay, sing it out in English or Spanish or any other language. Tongues, if you wish, as long as somebody gives us interpretation. <laughs> For all generations, to all generations, throughout all generations, sorry. Abel, who is Abel? De los siglos de los siglos. Forgive my Spanish, it's not great. His power. His power. Beyond imagination. Beyond imagination. Abel. Abel. To him be glory. Cannot be measured. Within us. Now. now. More than we can ask or imagine. Dynamas. La gloria. La gloria. Throughout all generations. Power that is at work within us. In the church. All we ask. Amen. And now to him. More. 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 Christ Jesus. Forever and ever. Forever and ever. To him be glory. Is. Is. At work within us. Far beyond. Far beyond. Vastness. Vastness. Him who is able. Isn't it fantastic to hear the way God speaks through one another to reinforce God's word? I tell you, as, as I often think, I'm speaking to a bunch of preachers here, the purpose of preaching is for the sake of the preacher. If anyone else is blessed, it's a complete bonus. And I tell you, standing here, you know, responsible for this teaching today, I am blessed hearing the way God speaks in you, through you, to me. And I stand with you as those who are overawed at this text. I remember joining a church service, I was in a pew, when the local bishop was visiting. He preached, he presided, and when it came to the final blessing, he, he stood in front of the altar, and there was a pause, and he said, excuse me, I'm going to, we don't need that, right? Or maybe, we don't need that? This one works. Okay, good. There was a pause, and he said, hey guys, you think the final blessing is just a neat conclusion, a nice coda, yeah? For, for me to end the service, and of course everybody's like a Pavlov dog thinking coffee, coffee, <laughs> just two minutes away, yeah? Let me just tell you a thing or two about the blessing, he said. And what we had was a two minute teaching moment on the liturgical form 
and the role of a blessing before he then voiced it. It's very interesting here that this blessing, this doxology, actually isn't the end of the letter. Uh, elsewhere, it is. But here, well, today we have a 40-minute teaching moment <laughs> on, on the doxology. The formula with which, and I call it formula, it, presumably it wasn't formulaic when he first voiced it. <laughs> it has become formulaic, has it not? But that with which Paul's prayer ends. You know what doxa means, glory. Glory, we've had it from the very beginning, the riches of his glory, Paul began the prayer. After Josh sang that song, The Weight of Glory, couldn't help but see the connection there. A doxology is a very short hymn of praise to God, often used to end worship, prayer, songs. There are two other doxologies in the New Testament. Uh, I'm going to refer to both of them in a few moments. One is Romans 16.25, the other is in Jude 24.25. You will know both of them without even looking them up because the words of them roll off your tongue as good clergy steeped in the BCP. You use them yourselves, I'm sure, for formal blessings as well, perhaps, in, as informally. All three of them in the New Testament are based on the Jewish practice in the synagogue, surprise, surprise, from Paul, where some version of the Kaddish services, sorry, where some version of the Kaddish serves to terminate each section of the service. Basically, a set of prayers of praise, sometimes sung or chanted, sometimes simply said, that mark out different sections of a Jewish service. So as with this doxology, most of them exp expound the might and majesty of God and make some petition for peace and faithfulness. One fascinating discovery I've made about Jewish Kaddish. It's never to be recited alone. It's got to be recited with a minyan. That, that is a quorum of no less than 10 Jews. That number is exactly what Jesus was countering when he said, where two or three are gathered together. You don't have to have 10. You don't have to be working very well, is it? Shall I use this? You don't need 10 people in your church. You just need two or three people in your sitting room, if you like. But note, even with Jesus, you, you still need others. Yeah? Don't, don't do this alone. It's back to all the saints, all y'all. You don't get the whole story of God without the rest of the people of God reflecting different facets of the diamond. In Christian tradition, a doxology is typically sung to the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So you find it in traditional hymns where the final stanza is a doxology, I'm sure you could rattle a few off straight away. You find it often at the end of a Eucharistic prayer. You find it in other liturgies. The shortest, most common doxology is the one we typically use at the end of a psalm. Why? Uh, to turn a Jewish prayer into a Christian prayer. And just in case it was one of those prayers of lament that ends in deep darkness... Psalm 88 comes to mind. Yeah, that, that has to be about the worst of the laments, I think. Yeah? Then, you know, it still turns one outwards back to the glory of God. Glory be to the Father. So you probably need to say it without even thinking. But there's the weight of glory yet again. Not me, Lord. Yours is the glory. We could sing another. 
could we not? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. I mean, as well as praising God, each of those is also a very short declaration of faith. You know, it's an affirmation, it's a creed. We've just described the co-equality of the three persons in one God. No small thing, if I may. <laughs> I'm not about to preach a sermon on the tr Trinity, don't worry. <laughs> so here we have another doxology of Paul, and I put it to you at the start. We have a lot to learn. Well, I put it to you at the start, sorry, yesterday, only yesterday, that we have a lot to learn from the way in which Paul prays as well as what he prays for. Please, you who are leaders in worship, deacons, priests, think about the way Paul leads a prayer meeting. How is it going to impact the way you lead your prayer meetings? Paul teaches us about the God to whom we pray and rekindles our faith in the process of making requests and putting those requests into the context of, of what we're here for. And then finally, at the end of this very brief prayer, Paul fires our imagination. So there's a chance that we are moved to inhabit a bigger world, to, to, to inhabit the prayer we've just prayed, to stretch ourselves into the space that the love of Christ occupies, its height and depth and length and breadth. Now, you don't need me to tell you that prayer forms us, but I'm still going to say it again. You know, I'm preaching to the choir here. If you were a bunch of Baptists, I'd probably focus on this, frankly. Sorry, that's rude to Baptists, isn't it? We are those who typically care about liturgy. And by the way, you Episcopalians far out narrate English Anglicans on this front. You could please come to my diocese and lead my clergy conference and teach them a thing or two, because there are plenty of low church English Anglicans who would gladly dispense with liturgy. I've spent too much time in America to, to, to be happy with that. It is seen as a low church, high church distinction. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Anyway, this is why Canon Justin, have I got this right, is probably spending hours, weeks of his life following through that, what's it, A, F, zero, something, something? <laughs> you see, you know it by heart. You, true, you are true Episcopalians when you know the numbers of the... <laughs> In the Church of England, we only know the numbers of the things we really loathe. <laughs> you can Google it later, but GS Misc 2055 is one of them. Anyway... Uh, why otherwise, if we did, you know, if, if liturgy didn't matter, would we spend, you know, liturgical commission upon liturgical commission debating and arguing, and I hear fearing what a revision of the prayer book might look like, not simply because it's the form of words you say, but, but because it is that which holds us together. How we pray really matters. I think that's another reason I would want to encourage you to learn. I bet you do know half the BCP by heart because you use it so often. But equally to learn Ephesians 3 by heart so that you can, it can form the way you pray just instinctively. Okay, back to the parallel texts. This sounds like seminary, doesn't it? 
between those three doxologies in the New Testament. It's only in comparing them that I think I can appreciate what Paul is doing here. All three in the New Testament begin, now to him who is able. A doxology is not about us. Okay, one really obvious point there. And then Romans 16, 23, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory, is the Jude 24 one. Sorry. So Romans, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to his gospel and his proclamation of Jesus Christ. And Jude 24, now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of God. And here in Ephesians, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power at work in us. So if Romans is about strengthening us for gospel proclamation and Jude is about our courage and confidence in the face of false teachers what is Ephesians about first and foremost I put it to you it's about God doing extraordinary things things that we cannot imagine, let alone instigate or control, about God doing extraordinary things, and it's about us, thanks to God's power working through us. It's about God doing extraordinary things, and through the power working through us. God's plan, God's purposes, God's glory, God's fullness, Christ's indwelling, Christ's love, the Spirit's power in us. Do you get it? You really only have to cooperate and and for us to know our limits, limits of under, we've heard all about limits, limits of understanding the love of Christ, limits of containing the fullness of God, limits of imagining how much God will accomplish. But God does not have limits. There are no limits to the extent of his fatherhood. Remember? There are no limits to the riches of his glory. There are no limits to the power of the spirit. There are no limits to the dimensions of Christ's love. There are no limits to the fullness with which you may be filled. There are no limits to the things God may accomplish through us. Whoa. Friends, God is a God of abundance. Here the translation is immeasurably more abundantly more. I mean, Paul is, again, seeking for the right words. But we inhabit a world that cannot imagine the abundance of God. We inhabit a world that deals in scarcity. And that was true pre-COVID. That was true before Putin put the world into The cost of the war so far, yesterday, the Security Council announced $350 billion. 
And I feel that every day I have Ukrainian refugees living with me at home. I ask them, uh, uh, as we have the kettle boiling for a cup of tea in the morning, how was your night? And I've discovered that's not about how did you sleep. That's about how many shells fell on your hometown during the night. There's been one night, they've been with me six months, there's been one night when there weren't shells. Oh. We live in a world of scarcity, in a world that thinks what we see is all that there is. So that we, we, they, probably we, spend our lives squabbling over the limited rations, the limited rations of love, the, the limited rations of money, of work, of jobs, of credentials. That's the assumed currency for living, a competitive environment where there are haves and have nots, in which society becomes a zero sum game because there isn't enough to go round abundantly. Not so with God. Hasn't God given us everything we need to follow him? Hasn't God given us abundantly everything we need to follow him? Do you realize that, or, or despite my best efforts here, are you still absorbed in a, a sort of wartime rationing set of assumptions in our world? There are no limits to the things of God, to the things that really matter. I'm talking about faith, hope, and love. I'm talking about the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Well, maybe there's a limit to self-control. <laughs> I'm talking about the varieties of gifts, the varieties of service, the varieties of activities, 1 Corinthians 12 and all that. All the flowers and fruits of the spirit. The trouble is we act a little bit like my children. I recall, this was years ago, my pre-teen children on a family holiday camp. The sun was shining. That doesn't happen very often in Britain. The rides were free. The beach was three minutes walk away. There was the best swimming pool with the best shoots my kids had ever seen, five minutes away. And what were they doing but sitting inside the cabin, watching TV, and telling me they were bored? <laughs> You've been there. But I suspect half the time our church, church is there. What is wrong with us? What is wrong with us? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, how are we going to get to pray about what is more than we can imagine? That is my question to you. In a moment, I'm going to get you to turn to one another. Paul is inviting us to petition God in prayer for that which is beyond us and beyond our imagining. You know, to step into the Wonka chocolate wonderland. You've seen Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, right? Or you've read it. Yeah, good. Phew. That, that, that's the best picture I can come up with. The Wonka wonderland of God's abundance and Google-eyed to wonder and pray our way into a whole new world. Paul is on a roll. He wants us to know what is beyond knowledge. And when it comes to the love of God, now he invites us to imagine what is beyond imagining. Clearly, we need to grow our imagination. To imagine what is beyond imagining demands thinking the unthinkable. How do you do that 
besides from children's books by Roald Dahl? <laughs> that is my question for you. I want you to turn to one another. Again, two minutes. You have to be quick. What has fired your imagination recently? Hey, Patrick and Bishop Brewer, you need to catch each other. There you go. Okay. Okay, lovely people. I want to ask you a question. Actually, I want to ask you. I said we wouldn't have plenary feedback. But if what has fired your imagination is something that is worth sharing with others, can I beg you? to use the QR code and send it to Cynthia so that, you know, at the end of this session, she can float a few suggestions from the room. I just do want to ask you one question. As you've been sharing what fired your imagination, I'm going to give you two categories now, and I'm sorry if what you shared doesn't fit into either of them, but I'd be willing to bet it does for both of them. Was that which fired your imagination something full of joy and color and light and excitement? Or on the other hand, was it something deeply challenging, uncomfortable? So the, the Put up your hand if it was the joy side of the fence. Just look around and see how many hands there are. And then 
those of you on the struggle, suffering, challenge side of the fence, well, it's at least half and half. <coughs> I, isn't that interesting? Okay. <laughs> oh, yes, you're both and people. Gin and tonic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, um, I think the secret to imagining what is beyond our imagining is related to the stuff we ended up talking about yesterday, about taking vulnerable steps over the edge of our natural horizon to risk going beyond where others think the love of Christ could possibly be found. Yeah? And then, of course, discovering it's already there. Silly. Yeah? Okay. As our horizons, I mean, back to yesterday, as our horizons stretch out to grasp the love of Christ, so our imagination gets warmed up. Yeah? Yeah? I wonder how much exercise you give your imagination, frankly. You know, how often do you take it for a walk or, or take it to the gym, yeah? I think most of us, and I count myself among this, actually, I think I'm worse as a bishop than I ever was as a priest because I spend way too much time sitting at the desk dealing with email. That's not what you think bishops do, is it? Confession. But I suffer from sclerosis of the imagination. If someone puts the coffee cups back in the cupboard on the other side of the shelf, and I'm not OCD, I don't think, I get disturbed. <laughs> I mean, really? Yeah, it's not a new side of the cupboard, it's the wrong side of the cupboard, right? <laughs> Okay, I want to take you for a little walk into child psychology. You probably know this better than I do, but, you know, here's, here's my learnings. Child psychology talks about the relationship between imagination and play. I think of the Montessori movement in education, where the child leads their own process of learning through being encouraged to explore and play and discover for themselves. The idea is that feeds the imagination beyond the conventional didactic systems and categories. You may know of Sofia Cavalletti. Is that a name that rings any bells? Another Italian woman. I, I think she kind of had, was taught by Maria Montessori. She's done some wonderful work in the area of applying the Montessori method to the process of spiritual catechesis, resulting in a program called the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Yep. I first came across that at Messiah Episcopal Church in Minnesota. Robin knows it well, yes? But there's a sister program that sprung off from that called Godly Play. Oh, yes, I see some fans of Godly Pay, Jerome Berryman and all that. Both of them are systems of storytelling, Bible storytelling, that permit and encourage the imagination. This might make some of my more conservative sister and brethren here uncomfortable, I don't know. I feel it is a way to go deeper into the text led by the Spirit. So that a child enters into the story for themselves, typically with some creative wondering. You know, the, the wondering begins, I wonder what's the best bit here. I wonder what bit of the story you could manage without. But it goes on to an allow wondering about what it makes you wonder. Are you with me? So the children are encouraged to, inv to, to voice their thoughts and wondering, no wondering too wild, always starting with that wonderful I wonder, to which there is no 
answer. I mean, the, the wonderings are not questions that the teacher replies to. Actually, what happens is one wondering sparks somebody else's wondering. And you kind of get a, a different version of Alexio Divina. You know, you get popcorn. I'm told that if the imagination gets that kind of encouragement and exercise to wonder, especially when the person is still young, then it feeds the nerve endings that develop whole patterns for imaginative thinking and wondering. I know you're thinking it's too late. I'm, I'm no longer a child. No, it's not. But it is why listening to the child's voice in our Bible studies, in our worship, in our praying, might be really, really helpful and very good treatment for some of our sclerosis of the imagination. But I put it to you, this is my wondering, why is the Montessori method confined to children? Why? Why do we work so hard to foster the imagination in kids and not do the same with adults? How would it work with your Sunday adult forum? Where is there space for the joy of play and creativity that is godly? You know, I'm not talking about just some paints for the sake of it, if you like. Where do you feed the world of ideas and dreams and possibilities for yourself and for your people? I don't think we feed that through exegetical preaching. We feed our minds through that, but, but I'm not sure. Well, and, and, and there are ways in which that does stretch us, granted. But I, I'm, I want to go much further than that. The problem is that the permission to wonder gets shut down in a world of curriculums and targets and political correctness, yes, and professional accreditation and probably tribalism. It gets drowned out by duty. What about your, the, the agenda of your, your, I was going to say PCC, your vestry meeting, it's a PCC in Britain. I mean, is that a task list to get through in an hour and a half or whatever your time limit is? Or is there space for wondering there? How are you going to create that? Seriously, how are you going to encourage people to to get outside their box. To, to, you know, we are, we are saturated by, by television, by responsibilities, by you know, the expectations of parenthood, or in your case, my case, the expectations of leadership, aren't we? So we play safe. <laughs> we want others to feel secure. Well, I'm saying to you, this is not the way God, or rather the way Paul, is praying for the Ephesians. He's inviting them to go beyond that security because the love of Christ is secure, because God is secure. So amidst the busyness and stress, we need creativity and play. They are not luxuries. They are necessities. I've been involved through my husband, who, uh, uh, out of, uh, 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 who, who chose a parish with 15 people on the outskirts of Norwich in, the, in East Anglia uh, because it was the fourth bottom in all the tables of socioeconomic factors in the east of England. Actually, I teased him. What about the other three? I mean, you know, isn't, isn't that a little decadent to be fourth from the bottom? Because he was so committed to the work of urban regeneration, that was his absolutely fundamental to his sense of calling from God. I've also been involved in development work in South Sudan, as we've already mentioned. In both of those situations, one where I lived and the other where I've sojourned, I would say to you, the imagination is utterly essential 
for development. I mean, for physical development, quite apart from spiritual development. Unless you can, unless your imagination can take you to a change of circumstance, there can be no development. It's not luxury, it's essential. If you have the scope to be able to imagine your life other than it is, then you have the seeds for the process of change. But without permission and encouragement to dream beyond our givens, call it thinking outside the box or daydreaming or blue sky living, I don't mind, we are really stuck. Uh, I, and frankly, I think that's where our church has been and our communion has been over recent issues. I say that in fear and trembling, given the role I'm going into. You know, I, I really am preaching to myself today because God needs to give us an, an, a capacity to imagine beyond where we think, what we think is possible. But with the spirit to lift us, the daily grind can be transfigured by the beauty of holiness. Do we need permission and encouragement to one another to wonder? How can you help one another here to, to, to dream? D do you have buddies? Do you have, I don't know, cell groups, holy friendships, where you, you affirm one another in the gifts you see in each other, and then you push one another to go far beyond what would otherwise be your zone of comfort? It really takes relationships of trust to do that. And it's wonderful when a marriage is like that, but so often a marriage is the safe place. And, and professionally, as, as clergy, I think you need the professional challenge to each other to do that. Seek somebody out. Ask if you can do that over coffee once a month. I don't know. How can you be open to new ways of seeing and doing and thinking and praying? That is the challenge here. And when, the, when you have the new idea, how can you give it the space to pray it, to test it, to offer it, not to sit on it? How can you help reframe the conversation at the tired church committee on which you sit? So it's not all about which side of the cupboard, cupboard the coffee cups sit on or what kind of coffee. Yeah, we've all been on that one, I'm sure. Right. How? How? You might offer a little Bible study on Ephesians 3. <laughs> you might welcome the stranger to the meeting. I mean, I, frankly, I guess that's what Bishop Brewer did in inviting me here these three days. The Israelites were rescued from their myopia by the injunction to care for the orphan, the widow, the alien. It wasn't just for the sake of the orphan, the widow, the alien. That, that's, that's working for, that's patronizing. The orphan, the widow, the alien, think of Ruth, are the gift to the community. The stranger changes the dynamics, sometimes sparking a whole new set of conversations, but certainly forcing us out of our rut because we have to justify what we want to say in some new way, new language, so it's comprehensible to the other. And that is challenging. And that might just make us think, oh, it's not the only way, is it? You know, just think about the love of Christ. A stranger sometimes brings out the best from the regulars precisely because they rise above that routine comfort zone. Jose, that was the gift to me of our conversation with Kay and Jose last night, hearing about the wonderful things he, he's doing. We need to work at developing our imagination individually and corporately. So I'm offering you a challenge personally, individually, but surely as clergy, as leaders, our job is to develop the imagination of our people. At the same time, let's face it, God, God's working will still lie beyond our imagining. It will always be bigger than us, few. 
Yet, it does suggest that growing our imagination might help us to fulfill God's work, God's dreams for us. Yeah? It might help us get our calling. Calling is not a one-time deal, right? No. It might help us to further God's work in our little patch. I will with God's help. Yeah? So let's welcome God's work, given that God is committed to working through us. We'll come back onto that in a minute. What God does is immeasurable. The God of abundance does so much more than we can ask or imagine. Immeasurably more. So here we've got more exuberance from Paul. Over the top, surpassing, overwhelming floodgates of God's over the top longing to claim and reconcile and bless. So on this little note, I want to leave you with a picture of some kind of chemistry laboratory that is bubbling and fizzing with creativity and innovation and discovery and play, all in multicolored glory. And Charlie's Chocolate Factory is the best I can come up with. We haven't got very far yet, sorry. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. God is able to do what he does, far exceeding anything we can do or even imagine, but God does it according to the power at work within us. Do you realize what that means? It means that the normal way God works in God's world is within and through people. We don't know what God is doing most of the time because it's beyond our capacity to conceive or imagine. Yet God is doing it through us. Ours are the hands and feet. Two things. First, that is saying, friends, that God does his stuff, achieves his purposes, expounds his love normally and mostly through empowering you and me on his behalf. That's a sort of use them or lose them approach to sovereignty. Second, that is saying at least some, if not much of the time, we haven't a clue how God is using us for the sake of those purposes. How do you react to that? The first seems to me it's quite sobering, if not bewildering and somewhat foolish. I've already voiced this before. How utterly crazy that God should use fallible human beings for divine ends. When he could work by snapping his fingers or sending an angel or simply voicing a word just as he did at creation. It would be so much more efficient and infinitely more reliable but God chooses to work what is weak in the world and flaky and shaky. He chooses to work with us and through us because he works in relationship, because he believes in partnership. To God's set of values, the pros far outweigh the cons. Volunteers, managing volunteers, does that get you frustrated? Imagine God. <laughs> Imagine God, but that is the way God has committed. As to the second, having no clue how God is using us, I find it quite encouraging. No matter how sharp your spiritual antennae, you will never pick up all that God is up to. That means when it seems God is up to nothing, we are most probably wrong. It also means that whatever he is up to, it probably does have something to do with us. We can't distance ourselves. We can't say we don't matter or we don't count or, 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 or that rector is doing a fantastic job, but my work 
Mm. Sorry. Sorry, folks. You haven't heard me if that's how you're still feeling on the second day. We can't say our church or our fellowship is too poor or too small or too sad or too confused. Because it's not about our power or capacity. It is about God's. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The doxology is about doxa, glory. To whom be the glory? To God be the glory. Where? In the church and in Christ Jesus, in the body and in the head. Did you hear that mention of the church? This is the third mention of the church in Ephesians, but each is really staggering. Paul has spoken of it as that which fulfills the Christ as the body fulfills the head. Verse 123. He has spoken of it again as the medium which lessons of the very varied wisdom of God are being learned by spiritual intelligences in the heavenly region. Chapter 3, verse 10. And now he speaks of it in terms no less remarkable as the sphere in which, even as in Christ Jesus himself, the glory of God is exhibited and consummated. That's not the church over there. That's your church. That's the little one. That's the local community that embodies Christ. Yo. I think we have to conclude that God really believes in the church. Do you believe in the church? When Paul writes about the church, it's utterly clear. He's not thinking of systems and structures. I don't think he's thinking of bishops and archbishops. I don't think he's thinking of synods and councils or buildings. He's thinking of the Lord's holy people. He's thinking of you guys, all y'all, scattered across the world, down the centuries, into the little fellowships to which we belong, congregations who get together in their communities as the local franchise of Jesus Christ. We get together because through baptism we understand we're related one body vital to one another for exploring the vectors of the love of Christ, vital for rooting and grounding each other in faith and love, vital for demonstrating the reality of the reconciliation we have in Christ, vital for witnessing to the riches of the glory of God. Yes, the immeasurable, surpassable, incomprehensible, spine-tingling realities of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of Paul's prayer in these verses in Ephesians 3. Where they touch the earth and become evident through each and every little branch of the saints. Now do you see why Paul is keen to raise our sights, that we may raise our game it's a relay race that began at Pentecost when the Spirit came and it will continue as we pass the baton on until the earth is filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. But if I may, I'm going over time now. There are, I think, how many have I got? Three mistakes Christians can make when they take up that baton to serve God in the church. I'm taking this final line now, not just as a nice little ending before we go to coffee, but as the theological statement that Paul is making. One mistake is to forget who we're serving, which is to say Christians, and I suspect clergy more than ever, can lose track of serving God in the melee of themselves and their own needs and their people's needs. 
the need for fulfillment, the need for importance, the need for affirmation, the need for congratulation, the need to be needed. We all have needs, of course we do, and it's delightful when they're met. But I encourage you to recognize yours and acknowledge them for the sake of accountability and perspective in the hope of keeping God at the top. In the end, it's always and only and ever about God. When we invest deeply, there's always going to be a danger that we claim the church as our church. You know, the money we've raised, the new members we've brought in, the hungry we've fed. The worst is when an evangelist talks about the new Christians they've converted. What? We have to watch our language and help one another refer to God's church. When you pray, do you pray for my church, our church, or God's church? Remember, it's God whom we're serving in the church and in Christ Jesus. That might even cure us of some of our factions, our denominationalism, you know what. To whom be the glory? To God be the glory. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. If one mistake is to forget who we're serving, a second mistake is to forget the end, the purpose. Our task is to share the love of Christ in all its length and breadth and height and depth that through the church and in Christ Jesus, God may be known and glorified. Our task is to continue the work of Christ, ushering in the kingdom of God until he returns. Our task is not to rule the world or even heal the world. It is Christ who rules, who reconciles, who heals, not us. We're not God and we're not in charge. Phew. Our task is to keep going, not to drop the baton. If we do drop the baton, to pick it up again and to run again. Not to give up, to keep on keeping on through him who strengthens us with power through his spirit in our inner being. To be faithful rather than to be successful. Can I say that again? To be faithful, not to be successful. Look, we can afford to fail in a cause that is finally going to succeed. Keep your eyes on the far horizon. To whom be the glory? To God be the glory. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. To all generations forever and ever. And a third mistake is to think that the church is the kingdom, that God's promises and blessings were given for us, that, that they end with us, that somehow the church contains them. That's a toxic combination of myopia, amnesia, and selfishness. A loss of vision and a loss of memory combined with a preoccupation with ourselves. That was Israel's mistake in the Old Testament. Israel was called into being to be a blessing so that all the world might be blessed. But having received God's blessing, Israel became happy to hold on to it, failing to realize that it's in passing the blessing on that we are blessed. Let's not make the same mistake in the church. It's as we seek to share the love of Christ beyond ourselves, beyond our comfort zones, that we find ourselves renewed and blessed and stretched to realize afresh how broad and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Friends, there's a world out there that is dying to hear of this goodness, this abundance of God. To know there's a father who claims every family in heaven and on earth. There's a world out there that lives in scarcity, completely unaware of the riches of glory in God and the strengthening power of the spirit with which our inner beings are continually resourced and replenished. There's a world desperate for the means of reconciliation with their maker or with one another. And we know those means firsthand. We can testify from experience to the work of Christ who's broken down the dividing wall of hostility, whose love reaches beyond our capacity to comprehend. Let's not make Israel's mistake. And then Paul ends the prayer. Just remember where Paul is. 
are men, he says, from his prison cell. Over to you. That's what Jesus said to the disciples as he departed from them to heaven. That's what the Spirit announced again at Pentecost. It's what Paul is saying to the Ephesians. Over to you. And on each occasion, it seems crazy, foolish, unwise, a ramshackle, sorry, I don't mean to be rude about you, a ramshackle bunch of people. But a guarantee of strengthening to fulfill a task that is not ours, but with which we are entrusted. Are you up for this? Will you pray for this? Let's go for it. Amen. We have a number of comments and questions. You're going to have to be selective or else... Yes, exactly. The, ...that call for coffee... Well, you could slip out and slip back in again. Five minutes. So here we go. Imagination requires that we are not consumed by the present. The question is, how do we balance the current demands of the moment with dreams for the future? We have to learn to say no. We have to block out space on our calendars for praying like Paul for, I don't know, I mean, let's hear what fires the imagination. Talking with strangers, uh, traveling to some other culture where they do different, reading a book that is not, you know, the novel. It might be the novel, actually. Whatever takes us outside of our world to help us look and learn differently. That's, that would be the quick answer for me. Perfect. You clearly ignited our imaginations because people shared some of theirs. And I'm just going to honor them quickly. And if you have a comment, you jump in. Seeing God already at work in the lives of others, doing the unimaginable fires my imagination for more of what God can do. Seeing a problem and praying for what can be done. Where do I start? Where will it lead? Who do I need to talk to to move forward? A way to fire imagination. <laughs> um, an observation. I would love it if an Episcopal priest bragged about how many they had converted because it would mean it's more than zero. <laughs> <laughs> Our indictment is that most of us can't remember the last person we shared the hope of Christ with and then led them into a relationship. Can I just encourage you, one of the the challenges with a liturgical frame of worship is breaking away from it for the, the new. Uh, I, I don't know how other people glimpse how God is at work without testimony. And that testimony doesn't mean, you know, I was rescued from the moon by Jesus. It can be an answered prayer yesterday. It can be a conversation from this conference that you share. And please, it doesn't have to be just from others. I mean, yeah, even clergy can give testimony. How about that? <laughs> but, but I just think we, we have to voice how we see God at work if we're going to stretch one another's imaginations. Yeah. I think this is a challenge for all of us, which you have done beautifully as well. Imagining the possibilities that are only possible with God. Um. Here's another personal, uh, not mine, but someone's. My imagination has been fired by my introduction to my new parish, the joy of a multicultural congregation and their celebration last weekend, the joy of a congregation whose idea of outreach outside the walls is not limited to writing a check. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Have you ever come across pulpit swaps? It's one of those dreams that, that I, I, I think we ought to do more of across the communion. You know, it's, it's not very costly. It's only the cost of a flight. It doesn't even need a flight if you're doing it within this country. But, but you know, you just swap homes, cars, everything for a month. Pets. How about that? 
but but you engage with their congregation and they engage with yours. There obviously has to be something of a relationship of trust to allow that to happen. But but geez, I think everybody gains from that. Excellent. Patrick could arrange it with in Pakistan for you. How about that? <laughs> or South Sudan. I'm going to read two questions you choose. <laughs> One, you mentioned in passing your new role. What is the role you're going into? And two, it's another question about power. In just the seven verses we focused on, we've seen Paul pray that God's mm -hmm. power be mm -hmm. given and at work in his mm -hmm. people three mm -hmm. times. Why? What does God's power look like and how do I allow it to work? Please be as specific as possible. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I haven't, isn't it interesting that I haven't focused on power in, you know, the way I've read and what I focused on? I, I don't know why that is. Um, maybe I'm ducking something, maybe I'm in denial. Uh, certainly as a bishop, I have, I have found little more challenging than managing others' perceptions of my power. Mm. It, it's alienating and isolating and dis yeah, and disabling for me as for others. Um, I'm not sure I can answer that question quickly. Sh shall I just tell you about my new role? Uh, yes. I would love yes. to tell you about my ro new role because it, it's so much on my heart because it's so new. And, and frankly, I, I, I don't, I mean, I'm really stepping into the unknown with this role and taking a huge risk. Um, quite apart from anything, I lose my nice house, my nice pension, my, you know, the, uh, uh, do you know the phrase, the greasy pole? You know, yeah. it, it, I'm stepping off that in order to do something that is really has been at the heart of my calling since I was 18. I think I described that to you earlier. It's a call to the nations. Uh, I mean, th the calling is to build friendship and fellowship across the communion. And you think, how come nobody's well, of course, lots of people have been doing that before, but there hasn't been a formal role for doing it. And the fact that there is a formal role now for someone to do it may be off-putting, I don't know. But I do, in, in keeping with Bishop Brew, I do think there was a sea change at Lambeth n I I this summer. Of course, I've never been to any other Lambeth. I don't know if... No, you know, you I haven't know. either, Greg. Um, but but post COVID had a lot to do with it, um, where there was a depth of love and fellowship. And I seriously believe where you can embody the fellowship of Christ and see Christ in one another um, and honor Christ in one another and perhaps study God's word together, all kinds of other stuff just falls by the wayside. And it's not because our convictions don't matter. It's that Jesus matters more. Mm. Amen. So, uh, you know, I think my job is to help draw that out, facilitating contact rela relationships between others. Yes, it also will have something to do with uh, following through with the Lambeth calls and their implementation. But, but even what their implementation means in where there's provincial autonomy is a very complicated animal. It'll mean different things in different places. Um, and I won't be doing it. I shall be making sure it, it happens, you know, sort of prodding a few people, twisting a few arms. The, the part of the joy of being here is some of you have expressed interest in being involved and, geez, you'll be hearing from me again, I tell you. <laughs> um, so, all, 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 you know, all of that is about reimagining what God has in store for the Anglican Communion for the coming era. It, it won't look like the past, and I say that because our church has been born out of a colonial context. Mm -hmm. Now, that is really complicated. And yet, so much blessing has come out of compromised situations of power, back to power. How are we going to get over it? How are we going to turn that into blessing? What is that going to do in, in reflex challenge to our systems and structures? I'm expecting to be stretched beyond what I can currently imagine. 
Uh, and I just hope and pray I can stay in that space that isn't about assuming my design or instigating system is where it's at. Mm. Yeah? Okay. Is that, does that you. tell you enough? <laughs> Thank you for the way you have fed us and nurtured us and enriched our lives. And it's reflexive. <laughs>